you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast, the hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready, strap yourself in, keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times, because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks, Chris Voss here from the ChrisVossShow.com. Thanks for tuning in. We certainly appreciate it, guys. Uh, be sure to go refer the show to all your friends, or family, and relatives. We've got an amazing multi-book author. She's the author of about 20 books on the thing. On uh, She's probably going to have a lot more by the time we get done with this. We're going to have two more books up by the time we get done with the show. Uh, so we'll be talking to her about her books uh, and everything that she does. Uh, we'll also uh, be asking you to uh, go to iTunes and make a good referral on the show. Go to five stars. We certainly appreciate when you do that. Go to our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all those crazy places the kids are playing. And of course, my speaker and uh, consulting website, ChrisVossLeadershipInstitute.com. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here with a little station break. Hope you're enjoying the show so far. We'll resume here in a second. Uh, I'd like to invite you to come to my coaching, speaking, and training courses website. You can also see our new podcast over there at ChrisVossLeadershipInstitute.com. Over there, you can find all the different stuff that we do for speaking engagements, if you'd like to hire me, uh, training courses that we offer, and coaching for leadership, management, entrepreneurism, uh, podcasting, corporate stuff. Uh, with over 35 years of experience in business and running companies as a CEO, uh, I think I can offer a wonderful breadth of information information and knowledge to you or anyone that you want to invite me to for your company. Thanks for tuning in. We certainly appreciate you listening to the show and be sure to check out Chris Voss leadership Institute.com. Now back to the show. Uh, she's out with her latest book. It'll be October 11th, 2022. How do we get to the end of the year so fast? I just, that's the only way I tell time is by having authors on the show to give us release dates. That's how I know where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, she's the author of the newest book. You want to pre-order it where you can get wherever fine books are sold. That summer in Berlin by Alicia Cornwall. She's on the show with us today, talking about her books, and uh, she's originally from Ontario. She now calls the foothills of Canada's Rocky Mountains home. Uh, she's the author of uh, up to twenty novels. We'll get an exact count here in a bit. Uh, the woman at the front was her first historical fiction title. It's being followed by That Summer in Berlin, and she writes full-time. She loves gardening uh, and uh, knitting. She adopts stray creatures you can catch. You know, be careful what you're adopting there. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> if you stick with cats, I think you're okay. But, uh, you know, don't do like wombats or something. I don't know why you do wombats, but it sounded funny at the time. And, uh, the most exotic. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, you know, just just don't don't. I mean, cats bite, but just stay away from anything that's poisonous. Like, don't adapt to rattlesnakes or something. I learned that the hard way. Don't ask. Uh, oh. She creates magic words from cardboard, paint, and glue. She's clearly an artist. And uh, when she's on her work uh, at her desk, working on her next book, she's walking her dog. She loves dogs too, so that makes her a good person. Uh, welcome to the show, Alicia. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Chris. There you go. Okay, you can tell I'm a dog person. Uh, give us your dot com so we can find you on the interwebs and get to know you better. Uh, I'm at uh, LeishaCornwall dot com. Easy to find. Um, I'm and you can find the links there to uh, Facebook and Instagram and all the other social media. So, and and how many books exactly did you have, or do you have an exact count? I keep losing track. I think it's about 19. I wrote uh, <laughs> historical fiction for a long time before I started writing, or historical romance before I started writing oh. historical fiction uh, a few years ago. So, yes, uh, the romances are far more numerous at this point. <laughs> so uh, do, you, do you hop back and forth? Do you write romance books, uh, you know, do one romance book and do a historical fiction? Or are you kind of turned and, and doing more of the historical fiction now? I am firmly in historical fiction now, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I still love to read ro romance on occasion, and, uh, you know, I think up plots now and then, but no, I'm, I'm firmly in historical fiction. I find it a much more um, 
open genre about uh, with far less conventions that you have to follow. So mm -hmm. yes, I, I like the freedom. Yeah, plus with historical fiction, she can get paid to go traveling to go study the <laughs> place you're writing about. Is that is that what you do? I the other authors no. tell me that's what they're up to. Uh, I'd love to, but all those cats and dogs and bunnies. Oh, uh, that's right. Keep yeah. me keep me at home uh, a lot of the time. So uh, bunnies too, uh, huh? One bunny. One one bunny. bunny. Yeah. My daughter brought him home uh, during the pandemic, and he's uh, he's quite a quite a guy. <laughs> there you go. Just make sure the cats and dogs don't get a hold of him. That's, that's the main thing there. Oh, he's in charge. <laughs> oh, really? He's the boss. I, I would like to see videos of that. Uh, that would be great TikTok videos. A funny. It, yes. Ruling the the uh, the house there. Uh, so uh, you've written a lot of different books. Uh, in in and you've written about romance and now historical fiction. Um, what motivated you want to write this book? Uh, well, I, I started uh, researching different things about uh, the 1930s, which is a decade I find really fascinating. And uh, I mean, research takes three phases. First of all, you have the magpie phase where you're reading everything you can get your hands on, trying to find an idea for a story. And then you have the wormhole phase. You say, OK, well, that might make a good story. Let's start researching that. And you get you, you're looking for uh, a specific idea or a specific piece of information. And you find like other ways to go. And then finally you get to the aha moment, which is when you've got the idea and you know it's going to make a good book. So I think the, the, uh, the aha moment for this one was finding out that, uh, in the 1930s, the British were sending, uh, their debutantes, like 18 year old girls over to Germany with the process, uh, with the prospect of, uh, hopefully intermarrying and preventing a war that way. The upper really? class. Yeah. The upper classes had the idea that if, if they intermarried, that there couldn't possibly be another war. But I, I mean, they, the aristocrats in both countries sort of thought, OK, well, we're going to let Hitler do his thing, get the people worked up. We're going to let him build the country up and fix the economy and give, give them pride again. And then when he gets too big for his boots, we're just going to knock him down. Well, of course, that didn't work. <laughs> so. Ugh. Um, in the meantime, we'll sell him all the stuff that he can use, you know, all the hardware and engines and, and uh, planes and tanks so that uh, yep. he can have a war with us. It was quite extraordinary when you listen to Churchill, you know. Absolutely. Say, what the hell are we doing here? We're, you know, yes. we're, we're, I mean, we're, make, we're making money so that they can bomb the hell out of us. Yep. Um, yeah, it's quite extraordinary what took place in that war. It's like if we yes. started selling, it's like right now, if we started selling, uh, a military parts to Russia, <laughs> yes, and, exactly. and eventually they attack us and we're like, what? Yeah, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> why didn't like, you do that? <laughs> why? Why? And, uh, so there you go. Uh, now do your, do your books follow a series? Is there a character that's a, that goes through the series or, or each kind of a standalone? No, the historicals are standalongs at this point. Um, mm -hmm. There are um, additional sort of ideas for follow-ons with other characters. I mean, sometimes you fall in love with a secondary character and you just want to give them their own book. And that's sort of like they're, they're inside your head telling me, okay, write my story. <laughs> so it's, yeah, there's a lot, writers have a lot of voices in their heads. Explain the viral book. Wait, uh, do I have we're not openly. <laughs> yeah. I, I hear it's not schizophrenia if there's more than eight, if it's a personality. If you have eight personalities that are the voices <laughs> in your head, it's just if you think that another personality outside yourself is talking to yourself, then that's okay. schizophrenia. At least that's oh. my excuse I keep telling my psychiatrist. <laughs> I just keep telling them and telling people it's ADHD. <laughs> yeah, ADHD. That's the other excuse I think I use. I have ADHD and so do the other 10 people in my head, especially <laughs> the one who keeps saying yeah. kill, kill, kill all the time. That I, <laughs> the judge says I have to ignore now as long as I'm wearing the ankle bracelet. Uh, so uh, tell us, uh, give us an outline, an uh, overview of this book, uh, uh, in a little bit more in depth. I know with novels, we can't really give away the middle and the ending because, you know, then, then you kind of know. Well, it's about a, a young woman, an, an English woman, who gets the opportunity to take a trip to Germany on holiday during the summer of 1936 when the Olympics are on. And she's going to be the guest of uh, 
some upper class, high ranking German family. So she's asked to kind of um, use her camera. She's a camera buff. So to use her camera to sort of take a look behind the scenes of what the Nazis might be really hiding, like uh, preparations for war and uh, oh. uh, weapons build up and things like that. And she thinks that, uh, that they think that, okay, she's just a young tourist with a camera. She's going to be fine. Uh, and if she, if she gets caught, she'll just talk her way out of it. It's like, what, this old thing? You know, kind of an idea. Uh, and she's, uh, she's sort of asked to do this by a British reporter who can't really go to the places that she can because, um, mm. they, they kept the press very controlled, of course. Um, so she's working with him to try and, and find what's necessary. And she has to be very careful because there are people watching her. Um, wow. and of course, uh, there's always a chance she will get caught or will get caught up in something she can't handle and, Yes, you have to read the book and find out what exactly happens when that occurs. <laughs> mm -hmm. So is she officially a spy or kind of a spy for the because she's working for? I, I think she starts out as a very reluctant tourist, and mm. she's sort of uh, drawn into becoming a um, to helping somebody, and then sort of proving her skills as a photographer. And uh, then, yes, she is technically a spy. Ah, so hey. she's, uh, yes. And and so, uh, what what sort of study did you do to to come up with this uh, and 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 background sort of things? Uh, delve us into some of the the fun that was. Uh, well, I read a lot about the the Olympics and mm. a lot about the rise of Hitler, uh, which yes. was you know, heavy reading, uh, and uh, a lot about uh, female photographers and a lot about the the. Uh, four correspondents that worked in Berlin during the 30s, uh, which was very fascinating. <laughs> so um, it's that's the wormhole thing. I mean, you start researching one thing, you think, ah, oh, but there's that. And I can mm -hmm. add that to the story. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's kind of a theme that runs through it of, uh, of King Arthur. So um, sort of the once a future king. And she sort of thinks that uh, her father has brought her up to believe that you know, the lake where she learned to swim was the real um, pool where Excalibur came from. Oh, really? so she has this sort of um, feeling in the in her heart that, you know, this is this is part of my legacy. This is the sort of once a future king was saving the country. Um, so <laughs> that's a sort of a theme and a symbol that runs through the book. Oh, wow. Wow, that's pretty interesting. The, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it was a really interesting time in history in, in yes. that era. Um, and I imagine there's kind of a romantic feel to that era because, you know, it's still pre-war and it, there's a, I mean, there's a certain beauty to Europe and, and Germany and Berlin. Um, Absolutely. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, everything hasn't been bombed to hell again. I imagine everything yes. has rebuilt at that point. Um, and, uh, and pretty good. Um, that was really interesting to me that, that, uh, they would send young women over to marry up and I, I suppose, uh, keep a war from happening. They're like, uh -huh. they're like, Hey, we don't want a war in Europe. Send them wives. That'll fix it. <laughs> well, these, these, these women came back and when they were interviewed years later, it was like, Oh, I had the most marvelous time. And, and, uh, we, we didn't see anything. We just loved the way the men looked in the uniforms. <laughs> Going to parties and, and listening to the music. We weren't paying any attention to that little man with the mustache. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was sort of uh, completely denied that there was anything uh, political, any political involvement or support for Hitler there. So who knows? So it didn't help at all that they did this, huh? It didn't no. help at all. Wow. I'm not sure how many of them married into the family i mean like there were the mitford sisters which were a family of girls and there was one of them was a, nancy mitford was a writer and uh, unity mitford was a, a hitler devotee she actually went over and stalked a cafe until she got a chance to to actually meet him and she became one of his favorites yeah um, and uh, her sister was uh the mistress of the british equivalent of hitler the fascist union leader uh Oswald Mosley, and she eventually married him. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there were a couple of uh, very famous, uh, I guess, uh, British Nazis. <laughs> so, 
But yes, Hitler had a, a real thing for young English girls. So, um, and I think that was because he saw the connection with England. He he admired England, and he wanted that mm. uh, that connection. So he encouraged it. See, it's interesting how how uh, what's the correct word? The narcissism of some of these fascist leaders we see over the time, and how much they want to they you know, they really long to be uh, uh, someone else or or someone bigger. Um, and you, and part of the book is set during the uh, 1936 uh, Berlin Olympics as well. Yes. Yep. Yeah. That's sort of the backdrop of the book. Um, and that was a very interesting Olympics. Um, when they, they were awarded the Olympics in 1931 and when Hitler came to power and said, well, we're not doing that. That's, that's a silly thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, people like Joseph Goebbels suggested that no, it has propaganda value. We can make our, we could make our debut on the international stage and show them how great we are mm -hmm. and how superior and how powerful. And, uh, and Hitler still wasn't convinced and they took him to tour a, uh, a, an arena. And this arena had been built for uh, a night, uh, an Olympic games that was supposed to take place in Berlin in 1916. Of course, it was canceled. Mm -hmm. So the first world war. And they said, well, we can't really expand it very much. And he said, what? I want it all torn down and rebuilt. I want a, a stadium for 100,000 people. It's got better than anything that's ever been done before in the modern Olympics. And that's sort of when he was convinced. So it wasn't the, necessarily entirely the propaganda value. It was also the chance to uh, show off his, uh, I don't know, good taste, <laughs> architectural skills. You know, I mean, he loved, he loved building things or planning to build things that were you know, large. And yeah, they have, have his name on or something. Um, yeah. You know, and this, this uh, historically, this happened a lot. Women were used to spies during World War II. Um, mm -hmm. we, I know we had uh, one uh, famous author on. She wrote a book about how women were used to smuggle stuff in and out and be spies and uh, saboteurs, uh, mm -hmm. uh, especially during, this was, uh, she wrote a book about, women who were doing this during uh, when, when the Germans put the, the Jews in Jewish um, Jewish uh, slums. They would, they would force them all to live in a very small, horrible place. And uh, they, you know, they had to have checkpoints where, where the, um, you know, you couldn't leave or come and go, but women would have the freedom to, you know, leave and go get food or, or goods or something. And they were, they were kind of deemed like, well, you know, they'll never do anything bad. And, you know, they're very good looking. So they would use their sexual charm to, to uh, engage the, sometimes, sometimes they would bring like, you know, guns back into the thing. And because they were so cute, they would, you know, the German soldiers would, hey, do you want to help carry that right back into the thing or out of the thing, you know? And, and, uh, yeah. you know, they would, they would be, uh, used in that way. And, uh, so, uh, yeah, they would, they would uh, get away with a lot of stuff, uh, saboteurs, spies, sometimes they would kill. I think it wasn't there a famous story that was based, uh, you know, the movie Inglorious Bastards, I think they stole one of the stories where, a woman, if I recall rightly, and maybe this was the author that we had come in, uh, she ended up killing or bombing, and and uh, you know some of them were really responsible for some stuff that they. Did. <laughs> well, I love the story of um, Audrey Hepburn, that tiny, delicate, absolute gorgeous little actress. Well, during the war, she it, she was, um, I believe, she was Dutch, and she lived in uh, in the Netherlands, and she would lure Nazis in and then kill them. Ah. That demure little little creature, <laughs> and I think that's what makes women good spies is that it's unexpected in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, people people expect this of a man, but not necessarily of a woman. I mean, you think of Mata Hari. I mean, everybody's like, "Oh, yes, that's wonderful." And then the pillow talk gets repeated. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, there there are female photographers who did this too. I mean, there was one who was uh, she was a devoted communist and before the war, and she married a British guy and moved to England, where she actually recruited um, uh, disaffected Englishmen to work for Stalin. And just among the groups that she she recruited were um, the Cambridge Five, uh, so Kim Philby and his friends. Uh, mm -hmm who became some of the most notorious spies in English history. So <laughs> I thought that awesome was awesome sauce. Yeah. Awesome sauce. So this sounds like a lot of fun, a fun <laughs> romp. And uh, is, this, is it a beach read or is it uh, <laughs> something you can sit down and read through? 
I, I hope it's something that people want to want to keep on reading a page turner. But no. um, is it a beach read? Uh, it's a fairly serious subject. I'm not sure if I'm a beach read kind of person. I, I mean, I love humor in books, but uh, uh, yeah, I try to sort of um, uh, drive people on with things that are, are surprising that they're not expecting to read. So there you yeah. go. There you go. Well, uh, any anything more we want to tease out on the book before we go? Um, I don't know. Is there? Uh, I I love the details of the story. <laughs> and if people can go and uh, go and research things like um, one of the most fascinating parts of the story was the uh, the movie that Hitler had made. Uh -huh. um, he hired uh, a woman as his yeah. as his director, and she had shot the uh, the famous Nuremberg rally documentary. And if you oh. have ever seen any pictures of the Nazis on parade. That's probably from that movie. And so she took a year before the games to actually create the technology, new film, new lenses, new methods of taking pictures under water photography. And she shot over a million uh, feet of film before the, well, during the games. And it took her two years to edit it. And it won uh, amazing reviews all over Europe. And she came yeah. to the U.S. to, uh, to promote it. And unfortunately, her ship landed a few days after Crystal Lock had happened, which was a um, a riot where Jewish uh, Jewish people were targeted across the country. Their houses were uh, broken. Uh, yes. Synagogues were burned down. Storefronts were were sort of uh, damaged. That's why it's called Crystal Lock, broken broken glass. And so no one would ever speak to her in in. Uh, in the U.S., so she never became famous there. But for a woman to be so innovative in the techniques that she is, that they're still used in sports photography today, and to be so powerful as to get the kind of freedom to make a film like that in Germany and, and within the very misogynistic world of film it's, itself, mm -hmm. she was a very interesting character, and yet she was manipulative and a liar and um, a lot of things, as well as a genius. So mm. that was one of the most fascinating characters I read about during this. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> you would have think that they would have said, hey, she's got a lot of film that we could use to know what's going on in Germany and, and maybe, uh, you know, good spy but sort of data. She was German, and she was um, very devoted to Hitler, and Hitler was very devoted to her, mm. although she denied it later. So I don't mm. think there was any way any of that was getting out of Germany. <laughs> Hey. Or out of, out of her very, uh, I don't know, grasping hands. <laughs> she I don't really know. I would at least tap really that good. film so you could, uh, you know, hey, let's, uh, yeah, we want to see your film. Uh, this is a great film. Well, this is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yep. uh, it's like a uh, good data. I mean, now, now we have satellites that do all that, but back then, yes. uh, whatever. But, you know, this is clearly why I don't run the government's, uh, <laughs> or the Pentagon. Um, so this has been more insightful. <laughs> <laughs> More fun to be an author than a politician, I think. We could just make it up. That's true. With it. <laughs> That's true. Plus, when you work for the government, you've got to follow rules, and I'm bad, really bad at rules. Um, yes. It's been wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you for coming on, Leisha. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks. It was lovely to meet you, Chris, and to chat with you. Thank you, and we'll look forward to your next book. Are you working on that yet? or? Uh... I'm in the magpie phase, <laughs> so we're the gathering ideas. And, oh, okay. And, uh, yeah. The magpie so. phase. I like that. I might use Absolutely. that. Well, how, what, so you're what's looking the for ideas. Ah, so is that what magpies do? They kind of go and they, they look for anything shiny and steal it. Ah. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, that's, isn't that what we do? As that's pretty much true. For the best ideas that's and steal it and twist it. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, I think Tom Peters called it creative swiping. Yeah. Where corporations copy each other's stuff and then they make the, they try and make it better. So they put yep. their own spin on it. Um, so there you go. Uh, give us your .com so people can find you on the interwebs. You can find me at LeishaCornwall.com, uh, which is very easy. And all the links to everything you need, to, uh, including getting in touch with me if you'd like to, uh, is there. Thanks. And thanks for tuning in to my audience. Be sure to go to all of our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all those crazy places the kids are playing. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time.